The second exodus. In the last days, the Apostle Paul gave us an admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the things in the events of the exodus were an admonition for the end times. Guys, this is the Bible Prophecy Channel, but I am so excited to share with you the story, to share with you the adventure that we've been on, the journey we've been on of the Exodus. We're going to go through the prophetic story, the prophetic details of the biblical locations of the children of Israel as they left Egypt and wandered in the wilderness and then entered the Promised Land. So we're going to show you through archaeology um, the, the places. We're going to have another video with more details um, about the um, archaeology that proves the sites. But basically what we're going to do, we're going to show you the sites. Many of the um, information we have is based on Ron Wyatt. Um, he's uh, discovered many of the sites. We'll give him the credit for the sites that he's found. There are other sites here that we um, also have found in our journey that we uh, believe are, are sites related to the Exodus and related to the story. Okay, So in the story, we, we have all this taking place and all of it relates to the exodus of the entering of the promised land in, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ into the millennium. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, it talks about we are all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He, and we did all eat the same spiritual meat and did eat the sp same spiritual drink. So this is the manna. This is the living waters which Christ give. And uh, for that rock is Christ. And and. Christ is that rock, and many of them, God was not well pleased, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. So in the admonition of the Exodus, the children of Israel, of course, were in a place um, called Goshen, and they were separate from the ten plagues of Egypt, okay? But then once they went through the promised land, once they went through the journey in the wilderness, God was not pleased, and many of them suffered this uh, plagues, okay? Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after either things as they lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them, as it's written. The people sat to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's a golden calf. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did and fell um, 23,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of us also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Okay, that's a, a bad and destroying serpent. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happen unto them as examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world come. So the ends of the world is the, is the whole Exodus story, it is the people coming out of Egypt. Okay, so the same thing is happening in the book of Revelation, the people coming out of Egypt. And it says, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation which is common to man. Okay. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but with uh, the temptation, make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. So, throughout the um, New Testament scriptures, we have the admonition of the Exodus. Okay. So, in this whole story, um, I wish I could just bring all of you to these places with me so we can uh, go on tour and go through many of the details. But we're going to go th through the uh, story quickly. We're going to start with the Great Pyramid and we're going to finish in Jericho. But before we do, let's look at the book of Revelation and the uh, story in the Exodus and the sites and the, the things that we see in Revelation match up perfectly with the Exodus. Now, here's just a quick example of how the book of Revelation is interpreted and viewed through this Exodus story. And we're going to go through this quickly. We have other videos on it. But here you can see the book of Revelation and many items. And then you see all the match of those in the Exodus story. So we have Christ introducing himself to John called the Alpha and Omega, who was, who is, who is to come. In the same way, Moses uh, who says, I am that I am, Ahia. Asher Ahia. And Christ said, To he who overcomes, I'll give a white stone with a new name. In Exodus, we had two white stones, two tables of stones of the testimony. Okay. Revelation, we have seven churches, seven ecclesia, which are seven candlesticks, seven menorahs. 
And of course, in the axis, we have the introduce, inter, introduction to the menorah, the seven branch menorah. Uh, to the admonition of one of the churches, it said, Balaam, the false prophet, and Balak. Of course, Balaam and uh, the matter of Baal Poor happened in the Exodus. So it's, Christ is telling us these stories that take heed, look, it's going to happen in the last days. And the eight things sacrifice to us and commit fornication. That's the same thing you see with uh, Jezebel. In Revelation, it says, he will fight with the sword of his mouth. And then we see Phineas in the 12,000 who killed uh, Balaam. Of course, we have the manna. Christ said, he who overcomes, I will give the manna, which is hidden. And of course, we have the story of the manna in the Exodus. To he who overcomes, I will give a rod of iron to rule the nations. Of course, Moses has his staff, and he rules the nation. He rules Egypt. Um, Sardis has a name which is dead, and, and there was, this is about the generation that died in the wilderness. There are 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 that were seated around the throne, and the 70 elders did see God in Exodus 24. You have uh, four living creatures, lion, ox, man, eagle. You have the four camps around the ark, Judah, Ephraim, Reuben, Dan. The lamb which was slain is Christ. And we know this is the Passover lamb, which we find out in clearly in uh, in Exodus chapter 12. There's a in, in Revelation. There's a penny, a denarian on the scales. They're measuring the harvest. They're counting the people. In the Exodus, we have something called the shekel of the sanctuary, and it's a census. So the reason we're doing this video is there's now a second census of the people. There's a counting. So Moses count the people. And he did so with something called a coin, shekel of the sanctuary. Now, the 12 tribes were around the lamb in Revelation 14. And you have the 12 tribes around the ark. You have John, the apostle, uh, in, in one of the 12 apostles. He receives a rod in Revelation 11.1. Um, he was given a rod to measure the temple. And we know that's Aaron's rod that budded in the story in Numbers chapter 17. Okay. Now, um, in addition to this, we know that we have the sign of the woman clothed with the sun on, Re on Revelation chapter 12. And afterwards, she went into the wilderness. So the wilderness is the exodus, is this story. Okay, so you see we highlighted the census, the counting of the people. So in Revelation, we have a census taking place two times. In Revelation chapter 7, you have 144,000. And then you have a great multitude. Okay, we're going to take you to the places to where we can. But there was a place in Paran where the spies went out into the promised land. Okay, that was Numbers chapter 1. And they counted the people in Numbers chapter 1. There was a census that was done. They did not enter the promised land. Okay, but the people were counted. There was an army. There were priests, just like you see. A great army. You see priests. Okay. And then when they traveled in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they went to enter the promised land through Joshua in a place called Shittim. And then the spies went out again, and that's in Joshua chapter 2, but the second counting was Numbers 26. So what it means is there's, two, there's a census that takes place. There's one in Revelation chapter 7, and then there's a second one in Revelation chapter 9. It's a great army. So that's the purpose of this video, is to tell you the second census taking place right now. Okay, I know that's a lot of information, but we do have a playlist on the second exodus where we cover all the details of the things we just mentioned. Here you can see the census, lion, ox, man, eagle, the assembling of the camps, um, Passover, the admonition, um, or excuse me, the assembly, the nueva. We're going to show you all the places in this video quickly, but we have more details. Petra, here's Paran. All these places we have in this playlist, guys. So I strongly encourage you to just, you know, take the time. We found the Ten Commandments in Paleo-Hebrew in New Mexico. You know, really interesting things in this journey. So um, even the present time, it, we're. this is a good video. I really encourage you to watch this one, the second Exodus gathering, the seven churches. But even the peace deal, later in the video, we'll show you how the peace deal relates to um, the end times. Okay, here's Ron Wyatt's map on the route of the Exodus. Um, here you can see his name underneath Ron Wyatt's map of the route of the Exodus. And 
the children ears are began in um, Goshen, and that's essentially the Nile Delta, and then they pass through over what we now call the Suez Canal in a place called Sukkot, and then they passed over, and then they were routed down. So they are routed down. This is Nueva Beach here. And then the children of Israel passed over, and then here's Mount Sinai. Now, as we head uh, north, later on, they are in a place called Paran, and we believe that's here. Then they, they, uh, Moses came to a place, uh, a mountain called Mount Nebo, that's here, and here you see Jerusalem. Right here is Jericho. So, um, why also discovered Kadesh Barnea, which is here. So we're going to go to many of these uh, places that are along a route, places in Egypt and places in Jordan. Okay, and then we're going to uh, finish up in here in Jericho. Our Exodus journey will begin in Egypt at, you see it right there behind us, the Great Pyramid. And you may wonder why the Great Pyramid? Why are you starting this and why are we talking about the Great Pyramid? Well, there's two interesting facts. Inside there are chambers and shafts and those chambers and shafts have score marks and people have found dates in them here you can see the score marks and the dates and they are in the center of your screen where the two intersect is 1452 that is the date of the exodus in the great pyramid secondly we have casing stones here you can see me standing on the original surface of the great pyramid that's called a casing stone there were 144,000 casing stones so the outside of the pyramid you see today um, is the inner structure. The outside of it had these smooth finished limestone casing stones and yes there were 144,000 casing stones on the outside. So the uh, chambers and markers on the inside of the Great Pyramid actually give us the date of the Exodus which is very interesting for us. Okay, So certainly this would have been around at the time of the children of Israel. Um, they would have known about the Great Pyramid but those uh, two fix, uh, important facts warrant um, the fact that this is where we'll begin our journey here at the Great Pyramid. Next, what I thought I would do is give you a quick tour inside. Yes, you can go inside the Great Pyramid um, and you can go through the uh, galleries. We'll show you uh, the entrance as you walk through and we'll show you two things. We'll show you briefly something called the Grand Gallery and the King's Chamber. So when you walk into the Great Pyramid, this is what it looks like. This is what it's like. You have to crouch down and you go through um, these passageways. So all the people, all the tourists are allowed to go in and they will uh, be walking through this narrow passageway. You have to crouch down. There's people coming the other way. And here you can see them and then you enter something called the Grand Gallery. This is called the Grand Gallery. It's a towering edifice inside the Great Pyramid as you're walking inside. And then this is the King's Chamber, and inside the King's Chamber is this sarcophagus. So this is a uh, sarcophagus inside the King's Chamber. The King's Chamber actually matches the measurements of Moses' tabernacle, so very interesting things of note. Okay, we're here at Wadi Watir. Wadi Watir is a place on Nueva Beach, and it's in Arabic called a wadi, means a like valley or washout area. And behind me is where the children of Israel would have passed through the steep mountains on either side. And the scripture says the wilderness enclosed them in. So they passed through only one route that would have brought them through the other side of the mountains brought them through this wadi, which enters out onto a beach called Nueva Beach. And of course, Ron Wyatt discovered this. He took an airplane over the Red Sea looking for a crossing place, and he saw this huge beach. It's about 10 miles wide. And he began to investigate this beach as a crossing place. So he was the one to discover this and this pillar. Now here you can see we're very excited We've arrived in Nueva Beach and we found this pillar. So Ron Wyatt described seeing this pillar. On the Egyptian side, he saw another pillar like this standing uh, in the 80s, I believe, on the Saudi Arabian side. It had 
ancient paleo inscriptions on it that what dated back to the time of Solomon. So Ron Wai believed this pillar and the one that was on the Saudi side were erected by Solomon. He saw Solomon's name on the pillar on the Saudi one, and he believed that was marking the crossing place for the children of Israel. So we're here on the Wave Beach at the pillar of the crossing place. Now, when we uh, we're at Wadi Watir, that's towards the middle of this beach area. It's very large. It's 10 miles north to south, or more than that, okay? So towards the middle of that is the Wadi, where they would have entered. Now, this pillar is in the southern portion of the beach, okay? And so what that means is the children of Israel crossed in the more southern portion of the beach area. As you can see, I'm pointing. I'm pointing towards the north. That's where the Wadi Watir is. And here's a view of the area. You can see how mountainous it is and dry and barren <laughs> um, area, okay? But there is a road that can head south, but here's the pillar, and Ron Wyatt saw it laying down in the ground, and at the time when the Israelis had the um, Sinai Peninsula, he believed that they, they set it upright. So now it's set upright to this day. Of course, the Egyptians don't recognize this because they believe that St. Catharines is the place of the real Mount Sinai. But we believe this is the crossing place. Here is the Red Sea. And it was around this area the children of Israel crossed. So the Most High separated the waters and they crossed the Red Sea. That's the Saudi Arabian side over on the other side there. Now, we're pointing out this southern portion because this is where the children of Israel crossed. Now, the reason they probably were directed toward the south is that in the north, Ron White describes seeing a fort. Here in Nueva, we have an old fort here. Um, some repairs have been done. Some finished plaster has been uh, placed upon it. And this is a fort that's in the northern part of Nueva Beach. As we look around, you can see the mountains here. And then the opposite way here is the Gulf of Aqaba. You can see a little bit of the blue there and the Red Sea. And Ron Wyatt described this fort as a place that may have existed at the time of the Red Sea crossing as an Egyptian uh, outpost. And where we are is slightly north in Nueva Beach. So what this means is that this fort here being in the north would have directed the children of Israel on the crossing to a southern uh, place and position. And that southern place we've shown as being the uh, location where Solomon placed that pillar. So here we have this fort. And let's get some shots. Okay, so there's been some uh, finished work. But it's hard to tell from the distance here, but the, there's really old wood doors and it's a historical site that's been preserved. But this could be an ancient, ancient Egyptian outpost. Here are some views from Nueva Beach looking out across the Red Sea to the Saudi Arabian side. Um, it's hard to tell if the real Mount Sinai is visible. Here we're trying to point it out, but it's kind of hard to tell in the video. But what we did is from Nueva Beach in Egypt, we then took a ferry, and this was our Exodus route, <laughs> and we took a ferry and crossed in, into Jordan. And in Jordan, we went to a place called Wadi Rum. And Wadi Rum is a place we believe is, is a region of Paran. Welcome to the wilderness of Paran. In Exodus 33 it says, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them and shined forth from Mount Paran, or Paran. And he came with 10,000 of his saints. From his right hand went the fiery law. Yea, he loved his people, all his saints are in his hand, and they sat down at his feet. 
everyone that shall receive his words. Guys, in this video, we're going to talk about the wilderness of Paran. Um, Numbers 10, 12. The children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. Or Paran. That's where I am right now. Um, this area is um, near the border um, of Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's where I am in Jordan. But I just want to explain further the trumpet blowing in the assembly of the camps. In Numbers 10, the Lord said, Make two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shall you make them, and you shall make them for the calling of the assembly of the journeys of the camps. Okay. Then, when you shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay. Now let's remember there's two trumpets. All right. And um, let's pay attention to this door. All right. Verse 4. If they blow one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto you. Now this is exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 1. Um, in verse 8, because the Lord, um, excuse me, verse 10, John, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard, as it were, a great voice of a trumpet, assembly, what? The princes, okay? So here, John is one of the princes, okay? We see this also in Revelation 4, 1. After this, I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first verse the first voice which I heard was a voice of a trumpet talking to me, saying, Come up hither. I will show you things that must happen hereafter and hear it. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Okay, so what do we have? Okay, guys, we're talking about the wilderness of Paran or Paran. And I'm in my, one of my favorite places, a cave. <laughs> in this message, guys, it's very, very um important that you understand the journey we've been on the lord has been taking us through the exodus okay and i'm physically located in a cave in the wilderness of paran the um time period we're in is the spies okay the spies um went forth to look at the promised land okay and as they did, they came back with a report, right? Now, we're in these 40 days. These are 40 days of judgment. We're going to go over these 40 days. It's very, very significant. Why? Because at the end of these 40 days, it's, it's a matter of whose report will you believe, okay? There's an evil report, okay? And those are 10, okay? And there's two um, overcomers. Yehoshua, Joshua, and Caleb. These are the only two that enter the promised land, guys. So now is the time of the report. The evil report or the good report? Can we enter the promised land? Now, the place where the children of Israel waited is the wilderness of Paran, exactly where I'm located. I'll have different uh, points in this video where I show you this place. You lead us like a flock, O oh Lord. Here we are at Lawrence Spring in the wilderness of Paran. You can see this spring right in the cleft of the rock. It said Lawrence of Arabia found this spring and wrote inscriptions. But the children of Israel were here. Okay, guys, again, we're talking about Paran. And we're here by this well. And Paran, I'm going to show you this, the landscape. I'm going to show you this area. Guys, it's so extraordinary to find water. Now, when you read these stories in the Bible, you might think, okay, you know, the person ran out of water. What's the big deal? You know, just go to a store, you know. Guys, there's, I'm going to show you, there's a grave right here. <laughs> so anyone that didn't make it to the well, they, you know, they didn't go far before they put them to rest. But guys, the, seriously, I've spent a few days here. I'm going to show you this environment. 
I mean, when you don't have water, I mean, this is serious. So the children of Israel pass through this area, okay? But this is also very significant. Now, this well I want to show you, there's a fig tree growing out of it. And uh, there's even some figs I'm going to pick and uh, check them out. You have to be careful. Sometimes inside there's, um, you know, there's things inside. So I'm not going to eat this just now, okay? In Galatians, it talks about this account. Uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about... Um, the bondwoman and the free, okay? And, th and these are an allegory of the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai with generous to bondage, which is Agar. And we'll talk about, we already talked about Mount Sinai probably prior to this segment. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, okay? So certainly uh, Ishmael dwelt in Paran, dwelt in, and here it's telling us that this is uh, generally Arabia, okay? And that's right where we are, guys, right on the cusp of it. So, guys, the real Mount Sinai is in Arabia, okay? The, um, the what we call the Sinai Peninsula is the wilderness of the Red Sea. So here's this well. Here's this fig tree. And here's the well just below it if the camera will allow you to see. That's water down there, guys. And that is amazing. So when these people are crying out to the Lord for water, guys, and you don't know the area, I mean, the Bedouin and everything, they know the area, but these are all in the distance. Let's see, even here, see that? There's a camp over there, okay? I mean, these are distant, distant, I mean, places. Okay, this here is the, um, is the graveyard, I was saying, okay? But guys, look at these areas. I mean, there is nothing here. And not only that, it is so dry. It is so dry. Even look at the, the there's clouds, you know, it's, 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 you're surprised there's even clouds. It's an extraordinary area, guys. So, um, I just want you to see this. I'm going to show you many shots of this area. Now, here's another fig tree. And over here in the distance, you can see a palm tree. So, this, there's a few wells here, guys, uh, down below these. I think there's some over there. Uh, I think there's some under this one, and then there's this one here. So it's just a, it's just amazing, okay? Um, I mean, wow, wow, wow! Look at that. Talk about desert wilderness. The children of Israel then wandered 38 years in the wilderness, and finally were instructed to enter the promised land. They went to the place. In Israel today known as Alat, they headed north to enter the promised land. They came to a place called Kadesh Barnea. This is the place where the striving of the rock, where Moses was supposed to speak to the rock and he struck the rock. So this is the site where we believe you can see major water erosion throughout this place, throughout this site. And so this is where we believe Kadesh Barnea. Ron Wyatt discovered this place, found um, Indication of the children of Israel's presence in this area. So it is from here that Moses struck the rock and then they had to go around the Red Sea. Here's our upper view. And this is the canyon running down from the mountains. I'll show you these uh, mountain ranges heading down to where we believe the uh, rock is right there. Then it would have headed out into the valley below uh, for the children of Israel. Certainly there's water rain runoff that's running through this, but the spot right here where my bag is where we showed you that stone and then uh, heading out to the valley to give you a uh, sense of the uh, rock here we have this here heading up and then there's a baffle rock the water coming out there and then we can see it going to the valley below and here it is up above
okay here's an excellent excellent map really really awesome map we can see here the southern border okay of the promised land really really identified very well now what we also have is the northern border up here is Hermon which is Mount Hermon this is the Sea of Galilee the Jordan River coming to the Dead Sea this is Jerusalem this is Mount Nebo where Moses views the promised land so the the route they first came down here and this is Kadesh Barnea the what the the strife in fact, let me let me uh, let's get a close up of this and take a look at this southern border because we want to point out the mountain range. See the mountain range going around? Okay, that is the southern border, and it's in this area that is Kadesh Barnea where we showed you. So that they they strove with Moses and they did not enter here. They could have entered. And, and entered from the south, but they did not enter here because Moses struck the rock instead of spoke to the rock, and then they were routed around. So then they passed around. They came to Nebo Mount, or Mount Nebo. Okay, Moses viewed the promised land, and then um, he, was, uh, he died on this side of the Jordan. Okay, Jordan River then enters the Dead Sea. And in the Dead Sea, we have Gilgal, we have Jericho, and we have Jerusalem. So this, this is the Jordan River. Amazing. So we saw a new wave of beach where the Most High parted the waters and the children of Israel passed on the other side of the Red Sea. And then, led by Joshua, they passed through the Jordan River. And he parted the waters at this approximate location. Here we're on the Israeli side facing Jordan, so they would have come on the opposite side passed through the waters and passed into Jericho. So they passed and here's the road. Now we're heading to Jericho. Um, Jericho has some amazing uh, history and everything, but it's not as obvious with the ancient walls as you might think. So they then head to Jericho. You know the story, they march around the walls. Okay, this here is the mountain of temptation in Jericho. Over here is an overview of the old city of Jericho and the archaeology. And here's like the new city and farming. And in this direction is the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. Over here, if you can see the range of the mountains, is Jordan. And then here is the sea, lowest city on earth. And the oldest city. Isn't that amazing to see the actual places and locations in the scriptures for the Exodus? I hope you enjoyed that. We went from Cairo, all the way to Jericho, with stops in between at Nueva Beach, uh, Paran, Kadesh Barnea, and then we saw the Jordan River and Jericho. So it's really amazing to go to those places. Um, this is just a quick view, a quick tour through those places. We'll have another video in the future where we'll go more into depth of the details and the archaeology and the proof of those places. But we, we did all that and we're so privileged. It's such an honor and privilege to, to do this work, to be able to share this story with you. But we did all that to tell you about this end times exodus. So we're entering this time period where the, the book of Deuteronomy, Moses recites the book of Deuteronomy on the 11th day, uh, excuse me, the first day of the 11th month, okay? And he recites everything, and he warns, there are certain warnings to the children of Israel, okay? And um, we can actually see those details pick up once we get into the book of Joshua. As you get to Joshua chapter 1, the Most High instructs Joshua, encourages him. He then um, gains the favor and notoriety of the people uh, but they do mourn for Moses for 30 days, okay? So you have 30 days, and then 
he sends out spies. So we showed you the place in Paran where Moses sent out the 12 spies. Well, Moses, um, excuse me, Joshua does the same thing, but he realized the mistake of sending too many people. <laughs> so then he sends out two spies um, to spy out the land from a place called Shittim. And those two spies go to Jericho and they view the city and they view everything. And this is the story of Rahab the harlot. And so Rahab the harlot helps the two spies and says, you know, uh, you know, have, have mercy upon me when you come to destroy the city because I see that God is with you. So um, she has this scarlet thread and she helps these two spies. Okay, So that's the, the story. It's never too late to cry out to God, say, help <laughs> when you're in the city of judgment and judgment is coming. Okay, So um, then they um, have the miracle of the crossing of the Jordan River, just like they crossed the Red Sea and went to Mount Sinai. They crossed the Jordan River. Amazing, uh, amazing account. And what happens is they're instructed to circumcise once again. The children of Israel were not keeping all the commands of 38 years in the wilderness. And the Most High instructs them once again to circumcise. So they do that. They keep the Passover. So now you're getting a pretty clear time of where the events in Joshua are taking place. They have Mourn for Moses 30 days. They're, they keep the Passover after they pass over the Jordan. They're in a place called Gilgal. And then Moses receives the instructions from the captain of the host to go to Jordan. I mean, excuse me, go to Jericho. So they go to Jericho. You know the story. They mount around the walls seven times, and they blow seven trumpets. So... Of course, in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, we have seven angels that have seven trumpets. Okay, so you can see the story repeating itself in the book of Revelation. Now, what happens is they, they of course, get the victory, and then there's uh, great notoriety about the children of Israel as they enter the Promised Land. They do have the issue with um, Achan in the accursed thing, so they uh, have the... Uh, issue of the AI and they get defeated and they don't know why and they find that someone has an idol okay so um, whenever there's a single idol the the entire children of Israel are decimated and Moses instructed them to not make a covenant with the people so when we get to Joshua chapter 9 it came to pass when the kings which were on this side of the Jordan the hills and the valleys um, on the coast they um, they, they are from Gibeon, and they deceived Joshua. They made it look like they were from a far journey to reach him and that they were a people from far away. So they made a covenant with him. And this is what you can see as well. The children of Israel, uh, you know, the, the Jews making a covenant, the peace deal with Donald Trump, okay? All of, all of the story is repeating itself. That's why we're going over the story, the details of the story. It's repeating itself in our day. So we have the children of Israel going through another census, going enter the promised land, uh, sending out the spies, uh, do, being uh, passing over the, the, the sea. First it was the Red Sea, then it was the Jordan River. So uh, similar miracles taking place, and then they finally enter the promised land. They should have done so in two years, but it took 40. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this part of, of, uh, of the second Exodus uh, playlist. Like I mentioned the videos, please uh, watch the playlist. Go over some of the sites. We go over more of the details of the sites. So uh, thanks for watching, and God bless you.